All right, hello, welcome back to lesson number two, where we're going to start looking at a case study. And to do this, we're gonna talk about, first of all, the importance of packages. In Python, quite a lot of people have written a lot of code, and they've written this up into modules or scripts, which they have made publicly available online. These bundles of code, which contain functions and methods that you can reuse, are known as packages and they're very, very useful because they provide a huge number of different ways of doing things often much uh, more easily than you would just be able to in standard Python. So for example, suppose a customer has come to us. Suppose a customer has come to us and has said they have some LEDs, five LEDs behind a material film and they're trying to work out what kind of material film this is. They're illuminating the LEDs and they're shining through the material film and they have a measure of the luminosity of the, uh, well, the luminance behind the screen. They want us to model this with a series of different materials for the thin film to try and work out which best match the experiment and work out what the material most likely is. To do this, they have given us a CSV file which contains comma separated values of position <coughs> and luminance. Now we want to import that data into a Python script so we can analyze it and compare it with simulation data which we also have in text file format. To do that we could use straightforward Python but this would involve a lot of concepts that we haven't taught you yet and also it wouldn't be particularly simple. There is a much easier way of doing it using a package that already exists and some of you may well have heard of called NumPy which stands for numerical Python. If we want to use it in a Python script, all we have to do is type import space and then numpy or the name of our package. Once we've done that, we can use dot notation to access all the functions and objects within the numpy package. Dot notation is just, you name the host object usually, in this case, numpy and say numpy dot and then you can name any sub aspect of that host. So in this case, because it's a package name, we're gonna list load text, which is the function that we want to use. However, we can look at everything if we just use tab complete. This should work in the Jupyter Notebooks as well. These are all the options that I can get from numpy dot in alphabetical order. There's a lot, as you can see. This includes all functions, classes, objects, constants, methods, everything. Okay, so we've got our CSV file. Let's load it in. We're gonna use load text to do it because this will be simpler. It's called experiment01.csv. Let's just do that. Ah, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, it's saying that it could not convert string to float. Now this is because of an aspect of load text that you won't be aware of, but I do know about, which is that load text assumes that the delimiter separating the numerical values in the, in the file that you provide it will be spaces or white space. So we need to tell it specifically that in this case, delimiter is equal to a comma. There we go, and that loads in the data. Obviously we're not doing anything with it yet, it's just hanging output. So let's assign it to a variable and we'll call it data. What is this? Data is this object. It contains all of the data in a two dimensional array. Now this is a new type. You won't have seen this before. An array is a NumPy array. It is the core feature of NumPy as a package. If we use the type function on it that I talked about in the previous lesson, we can see that it is of type numpy.nd array, which stands for n-dimensional array. In this case, data is two dimensions, and we can look at the shape of data by using the dot notation to examine the property's shape. So data.shape is 100 rows by two columns. Now, if we wanted to access an individual element within the array, what we need to do is use something called indexing. To index something, you provide the variable name that you're indexing, then open square brackets, and then we want to uh, name the row and the column. So let's say first row, 
first column. And that would get us one value. Now this is uh, Python, and in Python and other C-like languages, arrays start from zero. Zero is the first element, and one is the second, and so on. So that's why we say zero, zero. That is the first row, first column. We could easily say first row, second column, or first row, so let's say third row, second column, and so on. And we can access everything this way. Crucially, we can use minus one to get the last element. So in this case, we're saying last row, second column. We could even say last row, last column, which would be the same. You can also use this to get the penultimate and the tertiary, uh, the third before last, fourth from last, fifth from last, sixth, seventh, and so on as well. Now, one thing that we haven't mentioned is that whilst doing this, it's most common for users to want to not just access single elements. You want to access whole columns. You know, in this particular case, we've got position data and luminosity data. Ideally, we'd like to plot those against each other. And to do that, we need to separate them. So how do we do that? Well, we can do that using what's known as slicing. So to slice our array, all we have to do is say that we're going to slice from the initial element, so the first element, and we're going to slice, which is the colon operator, up to an element of our choice. So we could say up to the 10th, well, 11th element. However, when you slice, this last uh, element is not inclusive. So it will go from the first element inclusive to this 11th element exclusive. So if we do this, we will get a total of 10 rows. So we're going from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We didn't provide any columns. So the data assumes you mean all columns, and thus provides both. If we were to then say, okay, we want for the first column, we would get this, and we would just get 10 columns, 10 values. We could do the same for the second column. Similarly, we could keep this constant, and we could say we want to go from the first to the third, but not inclusive, remember, because it doesn't include the last one and there are only two columns, we put a two here. If we had just put a one, we would only get a single column because it is exclusive of the last integer. Okay, so the only thing to mention besides this is that we often don't need to put the last element. As you can imagine, you might want to go up to the last element, which would be minus one, but how do you go to that because it's exclusive remember so this will inevitably preclude using the last element in the array well we don't have to if you want to go up to the end of the list or the array you just need to leave it blank say start from here and go up to the end that's what that means similarly you can still don't need to say zero if you want to start at the beginning just leave it blank so this will say says i want the first row and I want the columns, but I want to go from the first column to the last column. And we can swap this around, like so. Now we can extract all of the first column, and we can assign that to a variable. We can do the same again, this time for y. And thus, we have sliced our array into two columns. Okay, so let's have a look at it. To look at it, we're going to need another package, another one that's quite popular and quite well known, not quite as well as NumPy though, which is called matplotlib. This is the unofficial plotting library of Python. Now, it's quite a lot to type out matplotlib.pyplot. every time you want to use something in matplotlib. So instead, we're using this alias by saying as plt. From now on, whenever I type anything in matplotlib, I don't need to type out matplotlib.pyplot, plt is enough. This is a standard uh, alias that's used all over the web and is recommended by matplotlib themselves. 
Okay, so just before we carry on, I want to mention that matplotlib is built in to Jupyter Notebooks, which you'll be looking at. You don't currently need to do the following steps to get them to work. If you do a plot, it will just plot in the Jupyter Notebook. This is not true of IPython interpreters like the one I am in, so I'm going to need to uh, carry out a few extra steps which you won't have seen before. However, we will go over these at a later point in a later lesson. First of all, we need to create a figure. Well, if even before that, I'm going to turn on interactive mode so I can show you exactly what's going on as I do it. Okay, so plt.ion interactive mode is on. Now I'm going to create a figure called fig. I'm going to plt.figure. This can be thought of as like creating a canvas. You see, we open this up and it's blank. This is our canvas. Now I can add some axes to that canvas. I'm going to call it adding a subplot. We're going to say this subplot is in a one by one grid and it is the first one in that grid. Now, if we go back, you can see that we've got some axes on which we can plot things. Now, we just need to call ax.plot, and then we provide x for the x-axis, y for the y-axis, and hit enter, and there you go. That's our plot. That's our data. Okay, so this is our experimental data. We've got luminance on the y-axis, position on the x-axis, and you can see it's quite noisy where I assume the LEDs are. Now we also have some simulation data. So let's do a cursory analysis of that. Let's have a look, see what there is. Let's do numpy.loadText again. If you have a look at the simulation data, you'll notice it's a bit different. It's in a different formats to our experimental data. For one thing, there appear to be three different columns rather than two. And if you just do load text, you'll find there's a problem. This is because the simulation data looks very different at the start, in fact, for the first 52 rows, it follows in a completely uh, unusual format compared to what we're used to. So we can just tell it to skip those. We can say skip rows 52. Skip the first 52, and then after that, start reading in the data. And after that, that's where the columns start. So we can do that. And as you can see, we end up with three columns of data. Now let's extract those as before. We'll call it sim this time. Say x is equal to sim all the rows first column. y is equal to sim all the rows second column. And we'll, for the luminance we'll use z sim all the rows third column. There we go. And now we're ready to plot this and compare it to our simulation data, to our experimental data. I apologize. Okay, so let's create a new figure. We'll call this one fig2. We'll have ax2 on fig2. One, one, one. And then this time we're going to do a scatter plot because we have three variables now. We have three dimensions of data rather than two. We have two of position and one of uh, luminance. So the best way to represent this would be as an X position, a Y position, aka a scatter plot of points, and then the color of each marker will represent the level of luminosity we see. So in this case, we have X on the X axis, Y on the Y, and then color equals Z. Now, if I draw this plot onto our, onto our viewing screen, you can see it in full. See here. So there we go. We can see the five LEDs. We can see the intensity thereof and what's going on. And we can see an immediate problem for comparison with the experimental data. Namely, that the experimental data comes from a cross section directly through the middle of our data. And we currently have these extra dimensions that we don't need. So we need to find a way of compacting this or taking a cross section directly through the middle. And also you might wonder why the plot looks a bit unusual. It looks a bit squashed. This is because the aspect ratio is automatically set in uh, matplotlib, and most of the time that's fine. However, in this particular case, we want the, ratio, the uh, 
physical dimensions of the x-axis to match the physical dimensions of the y-axis because they are the same, and so we set the aspect ratio to 1. That way, when we now look at the plot, you can see these two axes are equivalent and they look much better. Okay, so that brings us to the end of lesson two. Thanks very much, and I will see you in lesson three.